Welcome to the podcast. As you know, we're following Abdu'l-Bahá during his travels through the West. It's October 27th, and we're almost halfway through his stay in Paris. Abdu'l-Bahá met many people during his travels, including theosophists, agnostics, materialists, journalists, humanitarians, and dignitaries. There are many stories of individuals traveling great distances and expressing great longing to see the master. Here's one such story related to the Japanese ambassador. Viscan Arawaka, the Japanese ambassador to the European capital Madrid, was staying at Hotel de Jena. This gentleman and his wife had been told of Abdul Baha's presence in Paris, and the latter was anxious to have the privilege of meeting him. I am very sad, said Her Excellency. I must not go out this evening, as my cold is severe, and I leave early in the morning for Spain. If only there was a possibility of seeing him. This was told to the master, who had just returned after a long, tiring day. Tell the lady and her husband that as she is unable to come to me, I will call upon her. Accordingly, though the hour was late, through the cold and the rain he came, with a smiling courtesy, bringing joy to us all as we awaited him in the tapestry room of the Hotel de Jena. Abdu'l-Bahá talked with the ambassador and his wife of conditions in Japan, of the great international importance of that country, of the vast service to mankind, of the work for the abolition of war, of the need for improving conditions of life for the worker, of the necessity of educating girls and boys equally. The religious ideal is the soul of all plans for the good of mankind. Religion must never be used as a tool by party politicians. God's politics are might. Man's politics are feeble. Speaking of religion and science, the two great wings at which the bird of humankind is able to soar, he said, Scientific discoveries have increased material civilization. There is in existence a stupendous force, as yet happily undiscovered by man. Let us supplicate God, the Beloved, that this force be not discovered by science until spiritual civilization shall dominate the human mind. In the hands of men of lower material nature, this power will be able to destroy the whole earth. Abdu'l-Bahá talked of these and many other supremely important matters for more than an hour. The friends wonderingly said, How is it possible that having spent all his life imprisoned in an eastern fortress, he should so well understand world problems and possess the wisdom to solve them so simply? Truly, we were beginning to understand the majesty of greatness, whether mental or spiritual, is always simple. You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdul Baha in the West. Both the previous story and the talk for today cover the issue of religion being manipulated by man for his own will. It's important to understand that religions fundamentally should be positive forces meant for unity. And that is why the role of religious leaders is especially important, because their followers place more weight and value on their religious leaders' opinions than that of a politician. Let's consider these ideas when we listen to the following talk by Abdu'l-Bahá, read by Ali Yousafi. Talk on October 27, 1911. Religious Prejudices The basis of the teaching of Baha'u'llah is the unity of mankind, and his greatest desire was that love and goodwill should live in the heart of men. As he exhorted the people to do away with strife and discord, 
So I wish to explain to you the principal reason of the unrest among nations. The chief cause is the misrepresentation of religion by the religious leaders and teachers. They teach their followers to believe that their own form of religion is the only one pleasing to God, and that followers of any other persuasion are condemned by the all-loving Father and deprived of His mercy and grace. Hence arise among the peoples disapproval, contempt, disputes, and hatred. If these religious prejudices could be swept away, the nations would soon enjoy peace and concord. I was once at Tiberias where the Jews have a temple. I was staying in a house just opposite the temple, and there I saw and heard a rabbi speaking to his congregation of Jews, and he spoke thus, O Jews, you are in truth the people of God. All other races and religions are of the devil. God has created you the descendants of Abraham, and he has showered his blessings upon you. Unto you God sent Moses, Jacob, and Joseph, and many other great prophets. These prophets, one and all, were of your race. It was for you that God broke the power of Pharaoh and caused the Red Sea to dry up. To you also he sent manna from above to be your food, and out of the stony rock did he give you water to quench your thirst. You are indeed the chosen people of God. You are above all the races of the earth. Therefore all other races are abhorrent to God and condemned by him. In truth, you will govern and subdue the world, and all men shall become your slaves. Do not profane yourselves by consorting with people who are not of your own religion. Make not friends of such men. When the rabbi had finished his eloquent discourse, his hearers were filled with joy and satisfaction. It is impossible to describe to you their happiness. Alas, it is misguided ones like these who are the cause of division and hatred upon earth. Today there are millions of people who still worship idols, and the great religions of the world are at war among themselves. For 1,300 years Christians and Muslims have been quarreling, when with very little effort their differences and disputes could be overcome, and peace and harmony could exist between them, and the world could be at rest. In the Quran, we read that Muhammad spoke to his followers, saying, why do you not believe in Christ and in the gospel? Why will you not accept Moses and the prophets? For surely the Bible is the book of God. In truth, Moses was a sublime prophet, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He came to the world through the power of God, born of the Holy Spirit and of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary, his mother, was a saint from heaven. She passed her days in the temple at prayer and food was sent to her from above. Her father, Zechariah, came to her and asked her from whence the food came, and Mary made answer, From on high. Surely God made Mary to be exalted above all other women. This is what Muhammad taught his people concerning Jesus and Moses, and he reproached them for their lack of faith in these great teachers, and taught them the lessons of truth and tolerance. Muhammad was sent from God to work among a people as savage and uncivilized as the wild beasts. They were quite devoid of understanding, nor had they any feelings of love, sympathy, and pity. Women were so degraded and despised that a man could bury his own daughter alive, and he had as many wives to be his slaves as he chose. Among these half-animal people, Muhammad was sent with his divine message. He taught the people that idol worship was wrong, but that they should reverence Christ, Moses, and the prophets. Under his influence, they became a more enlightened and civilized people and arose from the degraded state in which he found them. Was not this a good work and worthy of all praise, respect, and love? Look at the gospel of the Lord Christ and see how glorious it is. Yet even today, men fail to understand its priceless beauty and misinterpret its words of wisdom. Christ forbade war. When the disciple Peter, thinking to defend his Lord, cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Christ said to him, Put up thy sword into the sheath. Yet, in spite of the direct command of the Lord they profess to serve, men still dispute, make war, and kill one another. 
and his counsels and teachings seem quite forgotten. But do not therefore attribute to the masters and prophets the evil deeds of their followers. If the priests, teachers, and people lead lives which are contrary to the religion they profess to follow, is that the fault of Christ or the other teachers? The people of Islam were taught to realize how Jesus came from God and was born of the Spirit, and that he must be glorified of all men. Moses was a prophet of God, and revealed in his day and for the people to whom he was sent the book of God. Muhammad recognized the sublime grandeur of Christ and the greatness of Moses and the prophets. If only the whole world would acknowledge the greatness of Muhammad and all the heaven-sent teachers, strife and discord would soon vanish from the face of the earth, and God's kingdom would come among men. The people of Islam who glorify Christ are not humiliated by so doing. Christ was the prophet of the Christians, Moses of the Jews. Why should not the followers of each prophet recognize and honor the other prophets also? If men could only learn the lesson of mutual tolerance, understanding, and brotherly love, the unity of the world would soon be an established fact. Baha'u'llah spent his life teaching this lesson of love and unity. Let us then put away from us all prejudice and intolerance and strive with all our hearts and souls to bring about understanding and unity between Christians and Muslims. You're listening to the Journey West podcast, dedicated to following the travels of Abdu'l-Bahá in the West. I'm Ian Carter, and uh, I'm in finance. I'm Jalal, and I'm an archivist. I'm Ramin, and I'm in economics. Throughout this talk, it is very, uh, not, not, not distant reference, but I guess a, a very general approach to this idea of, of religious prejudice, um, you know, with, without going into too much of an accusatory mode, obviously. We see, like, you know, uh, when he talks about the Jews in, the, in Tiberias, and how the rabbi is, is giving his one-sided view, as he says, about they teach their followers to believe that their own form of religion is the only one pleasing to God. And then we see a very like, concrete example with the rabbi. But, he, but, but Abdu'l-Bahá doesn't, doesn't talk about him in, in a very accusatory tone or even a, like, he, like the rabbi was necessarily at fault, but that it was more out of ignorance. It, I, don't think he, I don't think he paints him as a, like a malicious figure, but that someone that is acting out of, you know, they don't know better because they, like, their, their circumstances were a certain way and they're just like going in accordance with what they've been taught themselves. I don't know, what really stuck out to me was that even though he was talking like 100 years ago, it's so, mm -hmm. it's still happening today. Um, like extremisms. Mm -hmm. um, and he was saying like a hundred years ago it was the cause of strife. And he even said like he he quoted Muhammad talking to his followers saying like you have to respect the Jews and you have to respect the Christians. And like that's a message that people still need to hear today. Yeah, I think it's a still a relevant kind of discourse to have. It's an interesting phenomenon of the, the Abrahamic line uh, that everything, all the dispensations previous to are kind of accepted, but, uh, you know, the latest is the, uh, the most prominent, the latest is the most meaningful, and, and so on. Anything afterwards is, you know, could not but be false. Um, and, you know, that... That, that I think is exactly what Abdul Baha is talking about, this, this idea of, you know, inclusive of what I already believe in, but w once we get to that point where I don't believe it, then it must be wrong, and then we have the elimination of tolerance. I think it's for that reason that he only mentions Baha'u'llah briefly, mm -hmm. because he, he gives each one of the manifestations uh, the same amount of time in the talk. And so it kind of gives them the same station, and his very simply stated uh, just as the way he approaches each one. So that in itself speaks volumes, I think. And, and you know, coming from, the, coming from the West, we have more of a, uh, an understanding of, of uh, 
Christianity and the Gospels of Jesus Christ. And in, in that culture, we, we don't see, unfortunately, much of uh, Islam. And uh, in, in that kind of situations, a lot of misunderstandings do come about. And, and Abdul Baha talks about that. Not, not actually knowing like were the words of the Quran. You know, most people who would criticize Islam generally don't don't know much about it. And then, and then there are some people like like this is saying, um, who misre- misrepresent uh, each other's faiths, may look at the Quran and want to cherry pick verses, and then say, "Oh, Islam is bad." And then we on the other side we have people doing the same thing to the Bible, for instance, or the Torah and so on, and cherry-picking verses. But of course, you know, if we cherry-pick verses, we don't see the, the entirety of religion. Yeah, I think he... When he said that thing about... Um, yeah, the chief, the chief cause is the mass representation of religion by the re- religious leaders and teachers. So if people are looking at these leaders, and these leaders are telling them things that that are wrong from the teachings, if they're teaching them, like, wrong things. How do you say that? Like, they're, like, what, what Ian was saying earlier about cherry-picking um, parts of books. It's not just other religions that do that, um, to misrepresent other religions, but it's even those inside who, who for whatever reason, for love of power um, or a hatred of others, that choose certain parts of holy texts and use that as the basis for their teachings in such a way that it skews the message itself. So... Um, so when Christ did tell uh, Paul or Peter, Peter, Peter to, when Christ told Peter to put up thy sword into the sheath, which was telling him that you shouldn't use violence when, as a Christian, you shouldn't use violence. But there are so many Christians that still have just don't listen to that, and they can find other parts of the Bible that will that will support their own position. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to look at the reasons why why cherry picking happens at all, especially within one's own religion. I, I feel like one of those one of those reasons is uh, you know to satisfy the ego. You know, you you have your own ideas of like spirituality, for instance. You have your own ideas of what's right and wrong, and then when you go through you know your faith's holy book. Uh, you'll look. You'll you'll find in particular verses that you know, resonate with you, and things that kind of uh, support your own beliefs, and then the ones that kind of, kind of contradict your oh oh no let's let's move on, and then you come to another one that supports what you already believe in. And you're like oh this is see this is exactly what I'm talking about, you know it's almost like a satisfaction of the uh, of the ego. But also something positive that you can take away from that also is that as you grow as a person, reading a certain passage, you do, you can glean something differently from it upon a second reading. So even though you might have thought it said one thing on your first reading, reading again from a different perspective, you, you gain a different insight into it. I don't think that's true. Especially when you have, you know, we, when you have a plurality of people and everyone has their own kinds of opinions about certain things, and and Abdul Baha elsewhere says the the spark of truth comes from the the clashing of differing opinions, something like that. Um, and you know, I think that's I think it's even true here, where er, if 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 different different verses resonate with different people, and then they all kind of through a method of consultation. Uh, Come towards the, you know, the the discovery of truth, and you know, with detachment and so forth. Then you can see the truth. You can see the you can see uh, the truth coming out of these different uh, perspectives. Often in the, the the Baha'i faith, we speak of understanding as like an ocean, and so and using that metaphor, 
you um you can either delve in deep within the ocean but many people just go to the the coast and you can be completely satisfied with that so if you take quotes or small messages from different religions and then you carve a belief out of that it's ignoring the entire ocean there but you still have some sort of belief so then based on that you create prejudice and things like that and if you actually opened up to the ocean you realize that they're all in the same place and so they intertwine mm -hmm. and uh i think even in the <clears throat> within the talk adubaha mentions that should you blame the religion for the people and the the priests and the teachers of that religion so it's making a distinction between what the faith is and the people and how we twist and change and adapt the religion for our, our own means i feel like a lot of a lot of the the way uh, religious prejudice becomes overcome is through uh, consultation and through discourse you know um uh, i feel like it you know to some extent the betterment of the world uh, comes through you know, pure and goodly deeds and sometimes those good pure and goodly deeds might come through uh, pure discourse well not not let's not say pure discourse uh, but something but something like this especially especially when uh, Abdul Baha talks about uh, misrepresentation misrepresentation mo and most times comes through the mode of communication so it seems like the way to overcome that is similarly through that mode of communication. Um, you know, the, <laughs> it's 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 actually really funny because I feel like the 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 simplest way, or one one of the very simple ways to overcome something like this is to become involved in in the identity of a community. You know, a community is supposed to is supposed to encompass uh, people of different backgrounds and supposed to embrace some kind of diversity. And if, if, if one's not involved in that kind of diversity, then you know, you're, you're left with what's familiar. And then it, that's, that's, I feel what the, what the issue is, is if, if one stays too comfortable, they don't, they, don't, they don't feel the need to venture out. They don't feel the need to become accommodating to, to people who are different from them. Prejudice comes from a lack of understanding and... Like, I think people, to some extent, don't even realize that is the problem. Like, they think they know something about, like, say, Islam or Judaism because they were told by their religious leader or from whoever, from the television. But, like, the independent investigation of the truth, which is so important in the Baha'i faith, is equally as important to to, um, that's what I'm looking for, to apply to other, your study of other religions. Like, just because I'm not um, Muslim doesn't mean that I shouldn't study Islam. Um, not only because it is, like, uh, teachings from a manifestation of God, but... Also because there's, there's a list, I think especially in the past decade, like such a, such an attack on Islam in the Western world, um, that if I wanted to defend this religion, I should know exactly what I am defending. I think um, using the example of Abdul Baha, you can gleam the way that you should act. Seeing how he treated each of these religions with respect, he treated uh, Islam and Judaism and Christianity with the respect as if they were equals uh, among each other and among the Baha'i faith. So I think in every action that you take, if you use Adul Baha's example, you can see how you should react, how you should behave, how you should treat each religion. That's it for this week's podcast. Special thanks to our roundtable participants, Ian Carter, Jalal Fitz, and Ramin Bender. Also, thanks to Roshni Luder for reading the story of the Japanese ambassador and Ali Yousefi for reading the talk by Abdul Baha. 
Don't forget to visit the website for more articles on Abdu'l-Baha's travel at thejourneywest.org. Thanks for listening. Bye.